Hey, Kate. Hey, Eric. Uh, I'm so excited about today's podcast. We have another exciting episode. Today, we're going to talk about uh, vaccines and vaccination programs. Uh, the goal of this podcast is to discuss the science behind widespread public vaccination programs, the benefits, the safety data, the potential side effects, and the current recommendation. I recognize that this is a pretty debatable topic, uh, particularly in certain groups. The discussion is not designed to serve as a debate, however, but to provide a perspective from our medical community here at York Hospital. Uh, to discuss this, we have a great panel of resources today from our own community with representation from primary care, including family practice, pediatrics, as well as our in-house infectious disease expert, Dr. Thibodeau. Uh, also, interestingly, the timing of this podcast is kind of um, in line with a main statewide ballot on March the 3rd. Are you aware of that? Yes, vote? I am. So main question one is the people's veto referendum that seeks to reject a law passed by Maine legislature that eliminated most exemptions from state child vaccination requirements including religious exemptions. Um, if you remember, uh, Maine Governor Jant Mills signed a law on May 24th, 2019 to elim eliminate philosophical and religious exemptions to state law vaccination requirements. And uh, behind this, she cited the outbreaks of whooping cough in Maine counties uh, with low vaccination rates as a need to protect the public. So that's a vote that's coming uh, down the pike soon. So it should be an interesting discussion. I think the timing of this is perfect. Excellent. Hi, I'm Kate Ford. And I'm Eric Fogg. Welcome to C-Town. In each episode, we will discuss all things York Hospital, past, present, and future, as well as current medical topics to help us navigate that sometimes confusing world of healthcare. So before we get to our panel on that discussion, let's uh, do some hospital updates. That's great. So um, in Sanford on February 12th at 12 o'clock, we have a dementia lunch and learn, what is lost and what is not. Dr. Elizabeth Castillo will be leading that discussion. And also at the end of that month, um, I'm just putting this out there and more details to follow, but um, I'm working with uh, Chris, Dr. Christine Monroe from the Recovery Center here at the hospital on an open mic night, um, which will be held here at the hospital in the cafeteria. The dining services are putting together a menu of snacks, and we will um, meet at 7 p.m. on February 27th. And um, it's kind of for the York Hospital community and anyone else who'd like to come and um, and join in the fun. And again, more details to follow. We have time. Great. But it will have a leap year theme because it's leap year this year. Okay. And then in March, we have Dr. Michael Morwood, um, who is presenting on the robotic assisted hip replacements. And that is March 20th at 12 p.m. at the York Public Library. Excellent. So good, good things coming down the pike here at York Hospital. That's right. At the time of this recording, we have a couple um, uh, hot topics uh, and it's great that we have Dr. Thibodeau on because as we speak, the coronavirus uh, is really in the media now and, and this uh, outbreak certainly that started in China and now we're starting to see cases in the United States. So maybe we'll That's right. pick her brain a little bit about that yes. uh, as well as the other kind of interesting thing this week in terms of national news was the untimely death of Kobe Bryant in yes. those uh, his daughter and seven other people in that tragic helicopter crash. So that's been kind of the... Uh, the big news of the sad, week. Every sad moment. Time you yeah. turn on the TV. So, all right, that's great. That covers our hospital updates. So I think we should get into should get started get into this discussion. So to start this uh, discussion this afternoon, let's introduce our uh, panel uh, today. Kate, I'm going to let you take that. And that sounds great. Group. So we have three um, employees here. Harriet San Clement. Is that good? San Clementi. <laughs> Uh, who is a pediatric nurse practitioner, is one of our outstanding providers at York Pediatrics. She received her BSN at Fitchburg State and her master's in maternal child health at Boston College. Welcome. Welcome, Harriet. Emily Appleton uh, is a physician assistant who works as a primary care provider at Kittery Family Practice for all, nearly 10 years. She received her bachelor's of science degree from UNH and Durham in kinesiology and athletic training, then received her master's of health science and a PA degree from Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut. Welcome. Thank you. 
and Dr. Evangeline Thibodeau, who's our medical director of York Hospital Vaccination and Travel Medicine Program, as well as our Wound Center and Hyperbaric Medicine Program. She received her bachelor's degree, master's of public health, and her medical doctorate degree from Tufts University. She's a board certified in internal medicine and fellowship trained and board certified in infectious disease and is once again here to help us get our heads around uh, this vaccine conf conversation. So welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, so as you mentioned, Dr. Thibodeau, this is her second time. So she's yes. a, like a returning guest she's celebrity a, here. Yeah. We had her on. <laughs> she's a regular. <laughs> we had her on a month ago to talk about our our upcoming flu season, which certainly is in full swing. I worked uh, uh, yesterday out in Berwick where we had 60 patients. We saw a uh, facility record, 60 patients, and uh, at least 10 positive uh, flus that uh, yesterday, just there alone. Uh, we've had big numbers at all of our walk-ins. I'm sure the primary care offices and pediatric offices are, vis are busy as well with, with um, sick folks, so a lot going around. So to jumpstart this conversation, and as I was doing some research, uh, I was reminded to uh, my undergraduate training and education and whatnot about vaccinations and kind of where they came from and how they started. Uh, and it's kind of a fascinating story. Um, so kind of the origin of vaccinations um, started in the late 1700s. So what they discovered was um, milkmaids who would milk cows would pick up these blisters and whatnot on their hands and identify it as a virus called cowpox. And so a English physician named Edward Jenner decided to get some pus out of these blisters and uh, they injected it in a, it started with like an eight-year-old child into their skin to inoculate them mm -hmm. to prevent smallpox. So I don't know what kind of R IRB approval they had back then in the late 1700s to do that, but can't imagine doing that. And so it evolved from there. And then by the early 1900s, there was better understanding of um, inoculations and basically stimulating our immune system to um, combat viruses. And so by the early 1900s, we had vaccinations for pertussis, diphtheria, tetanus. Um, by the 1940s, they combined those into one vaccination, what we now know is um, DPT. By the 1950s, um, and my parents talk about this quite a bit, I don't know if um, you ever heard any stories about the scare with polio oh, and, yeah. and mm -hmm. people being super sick and paranoia, so much so people wouldn't go into public swimming pools and that type of thing. And uh, a physician by the name of Jonas Salk uh, at the University of Pittsburgh um, helped with a group of other folks put together the first polio vaccine. Uh, and since that inception has led to a dramatic fall off in, in cases of polio. Mm -hmm. um, by the 1960s, measles, mumps, rubella became available, followed by hepatitis B, haemophilus influenza type B by the 1980s. Um, I had chicken pox as a kid, but mm -hmm. certainly chicken pox was mm -hmm. uh, uh, something that came out in the 90s, rotavirus, hepatitis A, uh, pneumococcal, and the list goes on to um, the most recent vaccinations that I recall are HPV vaccinations now that exist that we um, started giving uh, young females now. I think both yes. males and females are getting it, uh, as well as the meningitis vaccination. I have a daughter who's in college, so that always comes up. So a uh, little background, a little history uh, about vaccinations uh, and vaccines to kind of set the stage for this, for this discussion. And I'm noticing that you have some smarties over there. So is that... <laughs> You're showing off your Smarties by all that background information. Well, <laughs> so there's a little backstory to the Smarties. So, because uh, I cut down the Hancock Hall all the time at the hospital, yes. and the first place you see is the cardiology office there, mm -hmm. and they have they this do dove. Have a candy. They have this Dove chocolate that's there, yeah. and I went to get Dove chocolate, and all they had was Smarties. Smarties. So, not really well, you're showing your smarties so, today by so, all that. So. Anyway, so let's get to our discussion a little bit. So um, again, we have a great panel here and folks that are on the front lines to uh, vaccinations in our vaccination um, program. So uh, I actually would like to start with Dr. Thibodeau and, and kind of throwing this out there. Um, certainly trained as an ID doc, uh, you're well versed in the benefits of vaccination program. Kind of what's the, um, where do we stand right now just in a in kind of a global thing with our current statewide vaccination program? Kind of Can a broad question. Can you define ID yes. State, before you yeah. move on? Uh, so infectious disease. So Thank I'm you. trained in infectious disease. I also have a particular interest in public health. So I'm interested in individual patients with certain infections, but I'm also interested in a global aspect of infections and preventing infections. And 
I think we do pretty well as a nation in terms of vaccines. If you look at how far we've come from what you've just explained, I think we actually do quite well in terms of um, vaccinating the public as a whole. But we we certainly have a lot more areas of opportunity. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, or no, it's, it's more yeah, just, no. I just kind of wanted a global. Uh, yeah, global kind of perspective. Um, each state, right, kind of has their mm. own kind of state laws as it as it relates to that, and and part of that, I think, Maine is now the fourth state, if I'm correct, with the law as it stands right now. When when uh, Janet Mills kind of mm. repealed some of those uh, restrictions and, and whatnot, um, it it seems like uh, the importance of like you said, the public health concerns related to vaccinations. I remember calling you this past spring from the York walk-in where we had our first case of mumps um, that uh, popped up. We had the index case at the York walk-in, a, a, a local kid who had been on spring break or vacation overseas, Spain, yeah. Spain, mm-hmm. I think, and uh, where they may have acquired it. And I, I remember the day one of my providers called me and said, I'm going to test somebody for mumps. I'm like, mumps? I haven't seen mumps in my 20-year career, and sure enough, um, came back positive. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of get your idea and sense of the statewide vaccination program. But um, let's talk about – explain to our listeners how vaccines work. Like, what's the mechanism for how they work? So every individual has an immune system. And our immune system is used to fight foreign invaders. So that's not just infections. It's – allergens or any kind of uh, foreign material that's not supposed to be in our body. So our immune system protects us. And if we see an infection, then we develop an immunity to it so that if we're, if we see that infection in the future, we actually have a protection against a second hit with that infection or any kind of proposed um, antigen is the medical term for it. So with our Our immune system is a very complicated, um, you know, people spend their careers just studying immunology. So our immune system is very complicated. What the vaccines do is they try to simulate the immune system in a way to, as if you were exposed to that foreign invader. So you can develop immunity from, from two ways. You can develop what we call natural immunity. Let's say you get exposed to the real influenza, your body gets exposed, you get sick, your immune system develops an immunity to it. So during that season, you may not, uh, you have immunity to that specific strain of influenza. Um, Or we can give you a vaccine to prompt your immune system so that if you were to be exposed to influenza, then it's already on the defense and will protect you so that you would not get sick. Now, the vaccine does stir up the immune system. So you may have a small reaction to the actual vaccine itself, but it's not actually the infection. It's tr- that's what it's trying to mask. So that's what the, the vaccines are doing. But when we talk in the infectious disease world, we often talk about certain infections like hepatitis A. Some people can be exposed to hepatitis A and develop a natural immunity to it. And we can test their blood for that. We can test Um, what's called an antibody or a titer level and see if they've actually been exposed to hepatitis A and they have natural immunity to it, then they actually wouldn't need the vaccine. But I do this in my travel clinic all the time. If someone's not quite sure if they've had the hepatitis A vaccine or they say, oh, I think I had that infection when I was in Mexico 20 years ago or something, someone told me that, then we can check their blood work to see if they've had natural immunity or they've been, or if they've seen the vaccine before. So the blood test actually doesn't differentiate between natural immunity and the actual vaccine, but they're both doing the same thing. They're both trying to simulate the immune system to come up with a response to protect you from the next time you're exposed to that particular virus. What's tricky about influenza when I use that in the previous example is that influenza mutates so much each year that we need to give a new vaccine because it's it's changed from year to year and we talked about this in the last podcast, that the uh, that's why we need to do, there's not just one universal vaccine that will protect us against influenza in subsequent years. Yeah, and that's a great point. We'll maybe swing back and try to 
catch your thoughts on the coronavirus, this new novel uh, sure. type of it, which is a similar type thing, right? We had an outbreak of a similar virus back in the early 2000s called SARS, right? And this mm-hmm. is uh, kind of related to that. Yeah. So so we'll swing back. So I have a question. We, um, we're very conscious in, in bringing our panel together and bringing Harriet and Emily to talk about um, the being on the front lines to this. So what is, uh, I'll, I'll I'll ask this of both of you, and you can both answer. What if, when either parents bring their children in or, or as adults come in for vaccination, what is, as primary care providers, what is your messaging to those folks who are either thinking about it or asking questions about kind of what's, what's your general stance on vaccinations in general? I think we both kind of agree, you know, we're both pro-vaccinators, um, but we always want to know what their questions the patients have. Um, because if they have a specific question, then we can actually get to the answer right away versus, um, you know, just kind of going around it. So I always like to know, what's your concern about it? What are your questions? Um, and then we can get right to it, and then we can go through the pros and cons of everything, possible side effects, you know, why we recommend vaccination. Um, but I always like to find out what, what's their questions, what are their concerns. And Harry, I, I would imagine with you, with parents, right, um, with with young children, maybe those questions are even more sensitive, I guess, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe something the parents read or, or there's a concern or that type of thing. And, you know, how do you handle those discussions? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's extremely important to take every parent's um, concerns to heart. Uh, it's a big responsibility to be a parent and to make decisions about your child's health care. So I start from that perspective, and I try to do what Emily does, and I try to identify what their questions are and try to provide them with um, uh, my experience and scientific information, and I always have them leave with written resources so that they can do the work themselves and try to provide unbiased resources for them. Um, And I think for me, because I've been doing this for 43 years, and spent many years in the emergency room, um, I can tell them without a doubt that we have made a humongous difference in preventing uh, childhood infections. In the beginning of my career, we were seeing children with meningitis and uh, blood infections and just very, very serious things, and even more ear infections to a simpler level. So they make a difference, and I know that uh, families sometimes pick up information from other people and they hear stories about terrible things that have happened. Um, and that information tends to circulate in social media much quicker than facts do. And I try to help them to process that. Um, and again, tell them, in all my years, I've not seen anything happen. I Can I tell you that nothing will ever happen? I can't, but um, I've never seen it. And I've administered I don't know how many (laughs) vaccines so I can tell you what we've prevented sure sure I try to provide some um, confidence for them excellent excellent Dr. Tibby you talked a little bit about passive and active immunity what about the notion of herd immunity Uh, Mm -hmm. can you speak to that for a little bit yeah that's really important so when we give a vaccine there's there's really no vaccine that I know of is 100% effective at preventing. You can't tell a patient, I'm going to give you this vaccine, and there's no way you're going to get this infection. You know, Everybody's immune system is going to respond a bit differently to each vaccine. So some people respond better. Some people respond worse. We know as a population, the elderly and the, the little infants and babies that um, have weakened immune systems on both ends, as well as the immunocompromised patients whose immune systems have been Um, altered by, let's say, uh, transplant medications or HIV infection. So anyone with a lower immune system, such as those three groups, the elderly, the babies, and the uh, immunocompromised, they will not respond as well. So, and they're actually the ones that are more susceptible to these infections, and they're the ones that when they get sick, they get sicker and they are the ones that get hospitalized with influenza because they get pneumonia, or they get hospitalized with shingles because they get a bad cellulitis. So these are the patients that it's so unfortunate they don't respond as well, but they're gonna get sicker. So it's actually very important for the healthy folks to receive vaccination to prevent 
the or to lessen the amount of circulating virus or whatever pathogen or antigen, as I explained before, is circulating in the in the community and, and wherever you're you're vaccinating. So that's the concept of herd immunity: is the more people you vaccinate, the the closer we get to complete eradication or eliminating the infection completely. So a good example also is pertussis. So we tell pregnant uh, mothers and we tell uh, spouses of pregnant mothers and grandparents, and you guys do this all the time, we tell them to get vaccinated in addition to the mother, not because we don't really care if, you know, the sibling, the the 15-year-old gets pertussis, they'll probably be okay. But the um, what we care about is that baby, that incubating baby. So the mother getting pertussis, she actually passes on some of those antibodies to her baby in utero, and she also has a, a better protection when the baby is born. So if that baby were to get pertussis, there's a very good chance they would need to be hospitalized and they would be very sick with it. So we do everything we can to protect that baby and immunize all of the uh, individuals that that baby could be in contact with in order to decrease the risk of that susceptible baby of getting infected with pertussis. And just to speak one more point on that is that, uh, like I said, vaccines are not 100% and they're not all life lasting. So there are some vaccines that we need to boost. So pertussis is a good example of that, that we give pregnant mothers a, a booster. Yes, they probably have some immunity from their childhood, but that immunity has waned or lessened over time. So we boost them and we just uh, give that immune system a little bit of a kick to say, hey, remember me, you know, you got to remember that in case like, you get exposed to pertussis that you need to protect me from getting pertussis. So that's what the, these booster vaccines do. So that's the concept of herd immunity is, is really vaccinating everyone as a population to protect the most susceptible. And isn't it true that... Um when we see either parts of a state or parts of the country that have um, less vaccination rates, we threaten that herd immunity in that particular community? Certainly, and it, and it can perpetuate itself because then the susceptible individuals get infected and they could potentially pass it on more and more. So, so Emily, one of the things that I hear um, people concerned about when I went through the history a little bit, when when certainly when I was a child, my vaccination schedule looks a lot different than the current vaccination schedule. And I think one of the concerns is, is it too many shots in a certain period of time or in one particular visit? How do you address questions like that? And is there a way to either alter the, the schedule or, or, um, or is there any science or evidence to support doing that or not doing that? Well, right now, the idea is to get, um, to protect the the little ones, right? The yeah. babies that are the ones that, just like Dr. Tipito said, you know, end up in the hospital, have the most side effects, or be seriously ill, you know? So that's why we say as many shots, or we give the shots, um, prior to two years of age um, to protect the littlest ones. And so, yes, when um, the amount of shots has um, increased in the last you know, 20 plus years, but right now the science does not back saying, oh, we should spread them out or we should give less to the little ones. Um, the science is saying it's absolutely safe to give the kids, the babies, um, the vaccines on the schedule um, and to have multiple ones at the same time. It's, um, the safety has been, um, sh it's been proven safe to go ahead and do that. Yep. And Harriet, to continue down there, are there what are the other common concerns uh, that you hear from parents with vaccination? Is there a common thing that comes up more often than something else in terms of an issue or a concern with mom and dad? There are many. Yeah. <laughs> How long is the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, had to say like time. the top, you know, the top, the top. two well, or three. I, yeah. um, giving multiple vaccines is definitely a top concern. Yeah. And um, to back what Emily said, there is no science that shows that uh, spreading them out into an, what we call an alternative schedule is effective. And what it most likely does is slows down the, re the ability to protect that child because we're delaying vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a tremendous amount of science behind why we give things at the time we give them, and there are many, many different reasons. Um, for example, at HPV, which you mentioned, uh, 
in the past few years, they did research that showed that if you get the vaccine before the age of 15, you have a far more robust uh, response. And so you only have to get a series of two versus three if you start later in life. So uh, young children, actually, because they have healthy immune systems, will respond much better, and that's why we give them young. And we also give them at a young age to prevent the long-term complications that can happen. So the second very common question is, why does my baby get hepatitis B when they're born? I don't want my baby to have a shot. It's just it's traumatic. Well, hepatitis B is a long-term chronic illness, and the younger you're infected with that illness, the higher your rate of liver cancer later in life. So the better opportunities that we can manage to prevent these things is for the health in the future. So um, there is no danger. Hepatitis B is one of the safest vaccines ever developed. And I tried, again, to provide the families to, to know it, it's going to be safer to do that than not do that. Um, the third one is probably autism. And um, that's been around for a long time. And I think that a lot of people have kind of made sense of what's out there for information and research and kind of have dealt with it and understand it now, but there are still many families that are very afraid, particularly if somebody in their family was diagnosed with autism as a young child. And coincidentally, the developmental markers for autism are going to occur at the same exact time we administer these vaccines. So it's coincidental. There is absolutely no research that ties MMR to autism. Um, and, you know, again, you can understand why people are fearful. Don't blame I think them. it's difficult, too, for a parent to say, why, <laughs> why am I getting this vaccine? I've never seen measles or I've never seen polio. And mm -hmm. why do I need to give this to my child when you don't get an immediate gratification from giving them a shot and making them cry? I think that's a very... It's, it's true. difficult. I think there's a whole there's a whole like psychology behind yeah. this delayed gratification and you know giving something. But I I think that there's a lot of um, it's it's hard for parents that's mm -hmm. their child and they and it it's not something that they really see any benefit from immediately. Right. They can right. hang their hat on. It, that's so true because they many of the parents are at an age where they never saw these infections. Exactly. So with. with 25, 30 years ago, I saw them all the time. And you do not want your child to have measles. if they. It's not a, a disease without complications. And chickenpox as well. And, and all of these things, chickenpox will, you know, can put a family out of commission for six months. <laughs> after, one after the other gets it, you know. Right. So there's economic burdens. There's education burdens to some of these things. So I remember my mother setting us all up to get it at the same time. When one of us came <laughs> down with it, we all got it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so that's a good segue into um, all vaccine. All vaccines are kind of um, developed uh, slightly differently in terms of, of of being a live vaccination versus inactive recombinant toxoid. Uh, but the thing that you hear a lot of discussion about is what what else goes in to a vaccination, right? What are the uh, preservatives and what are the other chemicals? Um, I'll put this to the panel if anyone wants to jump on this. Uh, what about the, uh, the safety profile of, of the additives to vaccinations? What's the, what's the concern and what's the story there? Anyone want to jump on that? <laughs> All I can say is that the, you know, these, these vaccines are studied, they go through multiple levels and layers of studies before they make it to market. We're not going to give something to someone that's not safe. And the each individual vaccine has different components of it. And I can speak a little bit the way that the some people will say live versus inactive vaccines. They that's just how they're going to prompt the immune system to respond to the to the inciting quote infection. Um, so live vaccines certainly have a bit more of a reaction. Uh, they they have a bit more side effect profile. Um, so when I give a live vaccine in my travel clinic, like yellow fever vaccine, I do counsel patients um, uh, about those side effects that you're you're probably going to have more of a response than an inactive vaccine. 
anyone can have a general re uh, allergic reaction to a vaccine. I say about five to 10% of uh, individuals can have some either mild redness or itching at the site to something more of a uh, disseminated rash and you know, very rarely a more concerning allergic reaction. Um, so those are much, much more common, but that's not really any more common than any other medication or any other intervention that we recommend for our patients and that we counsel them for. Uh, these other side effects that we speak of, they're just not the, we, we feel that the risks, um, the benefit far outweighs any kind of risk that, that someone could potentially have. Great, great. Kate, I know I'm hogging a lot of the questions yeah. here, but uh, <laughs> feel free yeah. to jump in. Yeah. No, you've touched on a few of the myths and mm -hmm. that. Are there any others that you could address of vaccinations and And I think the mercury comment that we mercury, talked about before, right. the preservatives. I think the mercury is, in, you know, I can't give you the specific number, but I do believe that the amount of mercury in these vaccines is so insubstantial compared to, you know, let's say some of the mercury in the foods you ingest. Right. Um, so these these vaccines go through very rigorous um, drug trials and approvals before they can be put into practice probably more strict than some of our food supplies. Yeah. I, I think another important point is that um, the, as um, she mentioned a minute ago, the process for developing a vaccine and bringing it to market takes a long time. The average is about 15 years. There's a very rigorous process that goes on. The scientific community is not allowed by law to receive any money from, from um, pharmaceutical Pharma, companies. Yeah. The watchdog organizations that watch for reports about adverse effects are, are completely separate. So that's done specifically to assure that there's no cross-contamination, there's no influence. So the, the amount of science we have behind vaccines is tremendous. And it's, it's always interesting to me the faith we put in more natural products, which is not, I'm not saying I'm not in favor of some of those things, but those have no research behind them, and yet they're seen as pure um, and natural. So it's about perspective, and, it, and I mean, understanding the science is above my pay grade most of the time, but it's rigorous, and I trust it, and I think it's important to know that, that these organizations are very separate from one another. I know we're winding down a little bit on time. There's a couple other things I just wanted to um, comment on and then give a last uh, chance opportunity for our panel to have any parting words. But we talked about safety of the vaccination. We talked about the uh, potential side effects. We talked about kind of how they were derived and that sort of thing. But Dr. Tibbet, you talked a little bit at one point about effectiveness. You said no vaccine is 100% effective. Mm -hmm. But Generally speaking, how effective are these vaccinations at preventing disease, knowing that there's no one that's 100%? And I think people get either frustrated or confused at times, and they pick on the flu vaccination. I think yeah. that's the common one. Like this year, it's you know yeah. less than 50% or whatever. So then they lump all vaccinations yeah. into that. But when we're talking about the standard childhood vaccination, what, what's the effectiveness of those? I'll, I'll let the pediatricians in the group speak to more on the, the pediatric side, but I can say that the flu probably is one of the worst. It's on average about 50% a year, but again, it varies by that group that I talked about. So the immunocompromised, the babies and the elderly will not respond as well as the healthy middle-aged individual. Um, I, from my travel clinic, I could tell patients that hepatitis A is actually a very effective vaccine. The first vaccine, it's a two-shot series. The first vaccine gives you about 90% immunity, and it's this, the booster shot that gives you, I never say 100%, but near 100% lifelong immunity. It's an excellent vaccine for preventing um, hepatitis A, and you don't need any booster shots from it. Um, I'm trying to think. Hepatitis B, from our, our employee health standpoint, there's certainly some people that just don't respond, but we do have a new hepatitis B vaccine out that's a two-series vaccine as opposed to three that uh, has just come out in the past year or so, and it is, it's, it's got a better response rate. So again, it's, it's a, there's a global number, you can say, but there's certainly an individual yep. response rate to each vaccine. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Anything to add to that from your perspective? I don't know the exact data, but the fact that we're not seeing these uh, diseases or viruses out there speaks to that, 
right? I mean, I've never seen polio or measles and in my 10 years, and I think that's definitely saying that you know, these vaccines do a great job because we're not seeing them. Um, and I think that speaks to that. Great. Excellent. Did we touch enough on the corona virus? Because I know that that is on yeah. people's top of mind. Um, is there anything to add about about that and what people should be? I know that um, my husband uh, works for UNH, and UNH sent out um, an email saying, even though it's unrelated to the flu shot, they're highly recommending that people get the flu shot Um so I just, and I know my daughter's college sent out a similar email as well, making sure. So I can speak on that. Sorry, I feel like I've been speaking no. <laughs> a lot on these topics, but the I have gotten a lot of questions on it, so I have done trying to stay on top of it. It's a novel virus. It's um, So a coronavirus is not a novel family of viruses. It actually causes the common cold. Uh, we don't test for it because we don't really need to test for the common cold. Uh, but it is, so this... Um, Wuhan virus uh, that uh, that uh, they first identified in Wuhan, China, is a type of coronavirus, uh, but it's a new kind of coronavirus. We get novel viruses actually every few years. So we've had the SARS outbreak um, in Asia over a decade ago. We had the MERS-CoV in the Middle East um, a few years ago. So these were both other examples of coronaviruses. They it has come to the media um, okay. much more recently. And I, th I think one of the reasons why we're seeing many more or hearing about all these cases is as soon as it was identified, it actually they, they got right on it and they um, are really trying to trace back. They have a group of epidemiologists really studying and trying to link and find the index case. And the, um, the, they developed the diagnostic test, mm -hmm. uh, so the methodology to test for this virus. And since doing that, they have identified many more cases. So some of these cases before, there was probably many cases back in November and December that were just diagnosed as a cold or a pneumonia. Um, but the now that we've been able to test for it, we've been able to really get a, an understanding of it better. The other point about the influenza virus is that if you want to protect yourself against a respiratory infection, the much more common thing to protect yourself against is influenza. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is a new virus. It's such that it mutated um, slightly so that nobody's immune system has seen this before. So everybody is susceptible to it. And the um, the so we have the testing. They are working on a vaccine as well. Uh, the fatality rate... I, I, don't know off the top of my head because it changes every day, but I think it's less than 5% of people infected with this virus actually die from it. So your threat from uh, the public health threat, A, in the United States is, is fairly low at this point. And so still your much higher threat of getting influenza and dying from influenza okay. than this novel virus that's initiated, uh, that they first identified in China. Mm -hmm. Does that help clarify? Mm -hmm. Sure does. No, that's great. And by the time this podcast airs, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll at least see where we are. There'll be right. much more information. Yeah. I think yes. it changes on a daily basis yeah. that, right. that you know, we'll, we'll have a lot more information then. Great. Well, Kate Thank and I you. would love to, we'd love to, um, love the discussion. It was excellent. It was very informative and we really appreciate you, can't you guys. speak for me. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you guys taking the time and, and joining our podcast. And thanks for coming back, Dr. Thibodeau. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Kate, that was a great discussion on vaccinations. What'd you, what'd you think? Yeah, I really liked it. And I, as um, Harriet was leaving, she handed me this clear answers and smart advice about your baby's shots. Um, and it, we'll post it with the podcast, but it's um, www.immunize.org. So um, I guess this is a resource that they use to answer those questions. Uh, frequently asked or not so frequently asked questions. So we'll Great. post that. Great. We'll post that for sure. And yeah. direct folks that what were some of your take homes that, uh, that you got from this episode? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about the people that are really against, um, immunizations and I've had conversations. I had a volunteer who really was, um, adamant about it. And so I'm thinking about how they're going to feel when they listen to this, but I think um, the bottom line is the research shows that they're effective and that's what they're going with. Right. Yeah. 
And it was really nice having uh, Emily Appleton and Harriet on the podcast. And for our listeners, uh, if you're looking for a new primary care provider or a pediatric provider, both Emily and Harriet are taking new patients. Uh, if you're interesting, interested in scheduling something, please call York Hospital at 207-351-2273. Uh, really good discussion. Certainly that's something that uh, we could have probably dedicated another hour to uh, right. and really delved into um, that even more. Um, as always, we certainly recommend and encourage any listener to seek knowledge and information to help them make best decisions for them and their family. Uh, I'd recommend certainly leveraging your relationship with your primary care provider to help guide you uh, and I know Dr. Thibodeau's office uh, in the York Hospital Immunization and Travel Medicine Clinic um, can answer any questions. They're a good resource. Um, yeah, they're a great resource. You can reach them at 207 351 3530. Nice job, Eric. Ah, thank you. Great job to you as well. And again, to our listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, check us out on Facebook or online at yorkhospital.com backslash C-Town dash podcast. And join us next time for another edition of the C-Town podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of C-Town. We hope you found it of interest and would love to hear from you about topics you'd like to learn more about. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find episodes by clicking C-Town button on the homepage of yorkhospital.com. By listening to this podcast, you're agreeing not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others, including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your own provider for any medical issues that you may be having. C-Town is a production of Darcy Creative in collaboration with York Hospital. Copyright 2020.